Hi, and welcome to the second lecture of Module 2. And what we did last time was just introduce the idea of the two main approaches to uh, uh, increasing international um, economic interaction. One uh, multilateral and uh, the other one is, is the more regional approach. We're going to, uh, for the first part of this week, we're going to look at um, the multilateral institutions and we focused last time mostly on the uh, International Monetary Fund. Uh, this time we're going to look at uh, World Bank very quickly and then spend some time in the World Trade Organization. And so remember that all three of these institutions were created uh, at the Bretton Woods Conference right after World War II. Um, so everyone, uh, uh, the developed countries in North America and in Europe uh, had converted over to wartime economies, so we needed to transition to more normal uh, peacetime economies. Um, they had also we had also just come out of uh, the Great Depression, so that immediately preceding World War II, and so we wanted to avoid one another another World War II. Let's not uh, make the same mistakes that led to the Great Depression, and how do we need to um, promote economic development um, so we can rebuild from uh, the devastation of the war and increase uh, uh, financial stability um, so that we don't uh, set the stage for problems like we had before, as I mentioned, the hyperinflation in Germany. So those, those were the goals of why the country is gathered at Bretton Woods. Um, and so we said, Last time, we focused on the International Monetary Fund, um, and the reason um, that was created was primarily to bring stability to the um, international currency markets. So we discussed that last time. Um, another main goal was to encourage economic development. And so the institution that was developed uh, at Bretton Woods was uh, the World Bank. So we're going to look at that uh, next. And so the World Bank was like I said, created um, uh, as a result of the Bretton Woods Conference. It's international in scope, and the main thing it does is it, it makes uh, grants and loans to developing countries, and uh, uh, so close to $60 billion, it's, it's uh, either loaned out or granted to uh, developing countries. Um, so not like the U.S., but uh, developing countries uh, relatively poor. And it's one of its explicit uh, charters is to reduce poverty and encourage economic development. And there's 188 nations um, now, and they're all, uh, they all chip in. Um, obviously, the, the largest amount is, is uh, chipped in by the developed countries. The United States is by far the largest contributor, but everybody chips in. And um, they have some say in, in how the money is spent. And so uh, the World Bank, like I said, was created from Bretton Woods uh, along with the IMF um, uh, and the World Bank. So the second major institution that we're going to be looking at that was uh, stemmed from Bretton Woods is the World Bank. And it initially was uh, what was, was created at Bretton Woods was the IRBD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And I think you can see after World War II um, why it was called that. And so the original purpose was to um, provide funds to rebuild Europe uh, after World War II. And then during the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were uh, four other entities that were added um, and to form what's called the World Bank Group. Um, and so there's five institutions in the World Bank Group, um, same, as, same structure and membership uh, as the in International Monetary Fund. So here's the five institutions of the World Bank Group. So when people say the World Bank, um, it's all five of these things. Oftentimes they're talking about either the IRBD or what's called the International Development Association, the IDA. So those are the two big ones that we're going to look at. Um, there's also um, a few other ones that we're not going to look at um, in any detail right now. So the, the two that we're, that we're going to be concentrating on for most of this course is the IRBD, IRBD and the IDA. And what they do is, um, is, is to assist, provide funds 
and assist with economic development um, for non-industrial economies, so developing economies. Um, and so they both focus on working with governments. The uh, IRBD makes loans to governments of middle income and credit worthy low income countries. So what the World Bank will will do, um, and uh, a friend in Boise is a consultant for the uh, IRBD, will go and evaluate what the financial um, infrastructure is, um, what the what the corruption levels are, um, to determine whether uh, investment projects in a particular country are likely to be successful. And so, the IRBD, um, if you're a if you're a low income developing country, then it will make a loan to you if it if you have the proper infrastructure. Um, the international development loan, uh, excuse me, international development. Uh, agency makes lo interest-free loans to governments of extremely poor countries. So both of these, um, the IRBD and the IDA, make loans to governments as opposed to private ent entities. Um, there's another agency or another um, uh, uh, part of the World Bank Group that makes uh, loans to private companies. And so here's what they've been. Here's what they spent their money on. Um, in 2010, so different sectors. So both the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, um, uh, we'll, look at mo we'll look at those more closely when we talk about um, uh, capital flows and sources of funds um, that developing countries um, how, do, how do they get money or funds in order to to promote economic development? And so the IMF and the World Bank are, are both uh, uh, institutions um, that that can access that they can access funds for uh, economic development. In addition to so so these are sources of, of basically um, funds from two large multilateral agencies, non-private agencies. Um, the other way that they that developing countries can get uh, money for economic development is through foreign direct investment. So large multinational corporations can set up uh, factories or or buy uh, uh, stocks in uh, in domestic countries in developing nations. So we talked about the International Monetary Fund briefly. The World Bank briefly. I wanted to spend some time on the third major institution that was uh, created by the Bretton Woods Conference. Um, it was initially called the International Trade Organization, the ITO. So it began in 1943 with 23 countries, and it was soon formalized in, in what was called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, or the GATT, um, in 1950. And the GATT um, acted to um, facilitate trade negotiations. So there are different rounds of trade negotiations um, among all the uh, uh, GATT nations um, that were focused on uh, reducing uh, trade barriers, specifically tariff reductions and others. And remember, in the, and last week, there was that graph that had, um, after World War II, the dramatic plummeting of uh, tariff rates across, and those were all um, related mostly to the uh, to the different GATT negotiations. And so the major principles of the GATT system, which carried over to um, the World Trade Organization now, is national treatment. These are key, these are key. Um, and so the national treatment principle is. Um, Imports have to be given the same treatment as domestically produced goods within a within a country, and so one of the one of the principles and goals is national treatment. So when they when they get together and negotiate, this is one of the objective functions, if you will. The other one is is non discrimination, and so you can't um, you can't. Um, pick on a particular country and give special treatment to other countries. And so this is uh, uh, called the uh, most favored nation uh, 
uh, standard in uh, uh, the GATT negotiations in the World Trade Organization, and and so um, it's and so in in uh, the language of the WTO, it's normal trade relations um, consist of of uh, trading relations that don't discriminate um, that that each nation you treat every nation uh, equally so um, you treat every every nation as you would your most favored um, trading partner so that's that's key we'll look at that again uh, again when we get to uh, uh, regional trade agreements and so um, countries where you have normal trade relations and there are countries that you don't have normal trade relations. So if you're not a member of the World Trade Organization, then you are not going to get normal trade relations status. And so that's a huge incentive for countries to become members of the World Trade Organization. So for example, here's a product, ham. Um, if you're a member of the World Trade Organization and you enjoy normal trade relations status with other, other countries, then the tariff rate on ham that you're trying to import into some other country is 1.2 cents per kilogram. If you're not a member of the World Trade Organization and you do not enjoy normal trade relations status, then tariff rates on, on ham that you're trying to import into another country are going to average 7.2 cents. So as we, we here's, here's a graph here that shows, I mean, look at gold necklaces here. So if you're a member of the World Trade Organization, then, uh, then you have, then you have a five percent ad valorem, which is a percentage of the sales price, five percent tariff on gold necklaces, as opposed to if you're not a member of the World Trade Organization, you get a, you get hit with an eighty percent ad valorem tariff. So eighty percent would mean that uh, if uh, if you have a gold necklace that sells for a hundred dollars, then with uh, um, uh, then your your tariff on on a hundred dollar necklace is going to be eighty dollars, um, so it's huge. And so another um, feature of the GATT system um, was they they had a they they this is the first time ever that there was a formalized system to resolve trade disputes, um, and we'll go into that and so that into that a little bit later. That's now formalized. Um, into the whole trade dispute uh, resolution mechanism of the World Trade Organization, which is a legal process. And so that was one. And then they also wanted to get rid of quotas and uh, uh, let's focus on tariff reductions and, and, uh, and get rid of quotas. Um, and multilateral in, in nature. And so I, I said there's, um, there's two dimensions to um, this type of multilateral institution. One is global trade negotiations, and then once the agreements are made, then there's a legal system that um, uh, binds uh, member countries to the provisions of that agreement, and it's transparent, so there's nothing that's hidden. And as I said, the World Trade Organization, the precursor from 1950 until the creation of the World Trade Organization, um, was the general agreements on tariff and trade. They, um, uh, there was a series of um, negotiating rounds that, uh, that uh, dramatically reduced tariffs and quotas and non-tariff barriers. So here's the, here's the list of them. <clears throat> and uh, we'll look, so look at a couple of these. Um, the Uruguay round resulted in the creation of, uh, of the World Trade Organization. <clears throat> and so the current, the current round of negotiations in the World Trade Organization is the Doha development round. So it's currently still going on. So early on, since tariffs were still high after World War II, remember just before the Great Depression, there were the Smoot-Hawley tariffs um, and the retaliation by, uh, by the US's um, major trading partners. So after World War II, uh, tariff rates were still high, and so the early early rounds of GATT negotiations uh, focused on getting rid of those. Um, so during the Kennedy round in the '60s and the Tokyo round in the '70s, then they focused they started to focus on things other than just tariffs, and so they looked at uh, um, issues with one country um, dumping. Uh, uh, products below cost uh, to other countries, um, excuse me, 
and uh, they they uh, started to look at uh, subsidies. So one way uh, a country can protect its uh, a domestic industry is either to uh, have high tariffs um, to so to protect it from foreign competition. Uh, another way is is to just subsidize it, and so. Um, uh, starting in the Kennedy and Tokyo rounds, then subsidies um, started to be addressed. And then in addition to um, tariffs, then they started addressing a whole uh, range of, of uh, non-tariff uh, barriers. So we're going to look at all of these uh, later on. Um, there's a whole, we're going to spend uh, a whole week on different types of uh, barriers to trade. And as I said, the uh, Yuriko Uruguay ground of the GATT negotiations established the World Trade Organization in 1995. By this time, it had grown to 159 nations, so 90% of world trade uh, occurs uh, among uh, uh, members of the World Trade Organization. It's headquartered in Geneva, and um, it uh, so, and like I said, there's negotiations that that lead to agreements. And the World Trade Organization then governs the the, um, the enforcement and um, conducting of those uh, agreements amongst its members. And so, remember the GATT principles in terms of non-discrimination and uh, and national treatment. And so those are those are inherent in uh, the World Trade Organization <clears throat> and. Um, uh, each round of negotiations builds on what the accomplishment of the previous round. And so um, the agreements that were reached in earlier rounds of GATT negotiations, those still remain in place. And so uh, WTO members agree, yes, we will abide by those. And uh, the agreements that have been negotiated uh, subsequent to that. And so, like I said, there's two main um, avenues um, that under which the World Trade Organization operates. One is it fosters multilateral trade negotiations, so it promotes, um, uh, like the GATT, it promotes uh, countries, its member countries getting together, um, fostering the negotiations, setting the agenda as it did before, and so the so there's lots of, of action that, that happens during these trade negotiations um, in terms of trade barriers being lowered and contentious issues being dealt with. So that's one is, is the negotiations aspect. Um, and then the other one is there's uh, kind of an enforcement or a legal system um, that says, okay, well, this is what you guys agreed to. And so we're going we're gonna to oversee and let you know when you're not agreeing, when you're not uh, meeting up. Uh, with your agreements, and if if one member uh, complains that uh, another member is not living up to its agreement, then it can go to what's called the dispute settlement process, which is kind of like a court, um, very similar to a court, where one party can say this is you know one this country is not uh, living up to its agreement. Uh, here's our evidence for that, and the other country will say, well, we don't agree. I think we think we are living up to it, and we're not uh, uh, doing anything wrong. And there's a panel of experts uh, at the WTO that will listen to both sides, make a ruling, and um, then then uh, how to resolve the situation is, uh, um, we'll talk about that in a second, but the, um, the World Trade Organization is, is not, it doesn't have any enforcement power. So what it can do is it can say, okay, we, we agree. We find that, uh, for example, in the cotton case, that the United States uh, policies with, regarding its uh, sales of cotton um, violate uh, uh, World Trade Organization uh, agreements. And Brazil, you've brought the you brought the case to the World Trade Organization. We agree with you that this is this is harmful. 
um, the United States' um, uh, policies in this area are harmful. And so Brazil, here's what you can do to the United States um, uh, in order to uh, um, try to induce them to alter their practices. So it's a legal system for settling trade disputes, but it, the World Trade Organization is not like a, a supranational government. Um, basically, it's, it's um, every member of the World Trade Organization has agreed, voluntarily agreed, to abide by the, the provisions um, uh, from the latest round of, of trade negotiations. And so um, countries can do whatever they want. Um, the, the World Trade Organization doesn't have any, you know, there's not a police force or any kind of military force that it can employ. Um, and so it just says, look, you guys have agreed. This is what you've agreed to do. And so we're going to one monitor um, that you're abiding by the agreements. And if you're not, then we're going to try to find ways to encourage you to do so. So, is it a supranational government that's dictating to us what we can do? Not really. Um, does, it, does it reduce our sovereignty to some extent? Yes, because we've agreed to abide by our, our um, commitments to the World Trade Organization and our trading partners. And we do so, like we will, we will you know, reduce trade barriers and reduce our subsidies to certain products. Um, not because we're nice, is because you know everyone else does the same thing, and that's good for uh, our uh, trade with our trading partners. It, it increases economic growth over time, and so um, it does. And so, to some extent, we can't do what we always want um, be, to protect a certain sector because um, we and the World Trade Organization is is looking at the broader picture. Um, so it does, you know, we've, we've made commitments to our international trading partners. So does it reduce national sovereignty that way? Yes, it does. However, um, it can't force the United States to do anything. It can try to incentivize it to do so. And so when we talk more in detail about the cotton case, this will become more clear, I hope. Um, so no enforcement mechanism, but what it can do, as I mentioned, is it, can, it, it will go to the panel and it can say, um, yes, we agree, Brazil, the, uh, the United States' cotton policies, especially um, how they promote exports of cotton to other countries, that's damaging and not, not, uh, not in compliance with, its, with our World Trade Organization commitments. And so a small country like Brazil um, or um, what's called the C4, there's uh, four uh, cotton producing countries in Africa that uh, informally joined it. Um, so a small country can say, hey, you know, this large country is doing things that are very damaging to us. Um, and so, you know, we want some relief. And so if it's, if it's one large country having a dispute with another, another large country, then the WTO said, okay, well then, you know, in that particular sector of the economy, for example, agriculture, then, you know, the damaged country can impose tariffs um, that will harm uh, the United States, for example, to try to induce the United States to alter its practices. But if it's a small country, then if it's a small country, you know, it imposes tariffs on imported United States goods, um, it's not going to really harm us that much. And so recently uh, in the cotton dispute, it was the first time that the WTO allowed for what's, what are called cross-sectoral retaliation. So it was like, so the WTO basically said, United States, you haven't been in compliance with um, your agreements regarding cotton. Um, we've been, you know, that we've initially found against you um, several years ago. We've encouraged you to alter your practices. You haven't yet. And so Brazil, um, it can impose tariffs against uh, 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 United States agricultural goods. And in addition, then you can, Brazil can impose um, uh, retaliatory actions in other sectors. So 
Brazil in, um, went after some uh, uh, intellectual property rights um, uh, uh, that damaged um, oh, Microsoft, Microsoft, for example, and uh, and uh, um, uh, Hollywood Studios um, all of a sudden were were being damaged because the WTO said yes. In addition to agricultural products, you can also then um, retaliate in uh, in other sectors, um, especially those involving intellectual property rights. So the so as I said, uh, uh, 1995 was the develop, was the formation of the World Trade Organization. Um, the current round of negotiations is called the Doha Development Round, and that stemmed from um, in 1999. There was a ministerial meeting, so a meeting of the WTO trade ministers from different countries met in Seattle, and uh, you may you probably don't remember, but there was it was a huge. Uh, um, demonstrations in the streets. Um, there were widespread uh, disagreements between developing countries and more developed countries because developing countries were saying, hey, we got the short end of the stick here thus far, and we want our interests uh, and we want to have a more level playing field. A case can be made that the early rounds of, uh, of WTO um, uh, agreements were more favorable to developed countries than developing countries and developing countries said you know we've been playing ball but it hasn't really benefited the, us that much and we want our interests um, uh, to be incorporated in the next uh, uh, round of negotiations and um, uh, it was successful and so the 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 ongoing uh, Negotiation round, the Doha development round, um, began in 2002, and with the explicit purpose of how can we, um, the World Trade Organization and its member countries, what can, what can we do that uh, will that will benefit um, uh, our developing countries? And so, one of the things that it's going to that it focus it has been focusing on is um, is reducing trade barriers. In developed countries, lowering the trade barriers in developed countries for products from developing countries, and so basically the initial agenda um, that didn't include um, provisions for helping developing countries um, uh, that got tossed out the window, and uh, and with complaints about earlier trade rounds being uh, unfair to developing countries. So the focus now is is what can we do to help developing uh, countries. And that's the end of this one.